Hello friends, I'm Alana and welcome to my channel. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, and solely because it is relevant to what we're going to be talking about in this video, I've been working in the games industry for just under a decade. I worked for IGN full time for three years, reviewed a lot of games from them, for them, and started out in print magazines and have worked for a bunch of different websites, including many of the major ones whose names you know. Basically, I feel like I have the experience to talk about what I'm talking about today for any of you who have no idea who I am. Moving on. This is going to be kind of a tough video because there are certain topics that, especially when you work in games media, are really hard to talk about. To give you a very good example, um, I played Mass Effect Andromeda um, long before it came out. The whole world was very excited about Mass Effect Andromeda. And I played it for about three hours and I walked out of the room and was crushed because I had the thought, oh no, it's bad. I can't lie in good conscience and tell the internet that it's good, but because they want to hear that it's good, when I say it's bad, they're going to fucking hate me. Therein lies a complicated issue with covering any kind of fan media as your job in any critical way. Saying that I thought Mass Effect Andromeda was going to be bad, again, at a point in time where it seemed like the whole world thought it was going to be good, meant that I did get a lot of shit on the internet for a long time. But point being, I knew people didn't want to hear it, just like I know people don't really want to hear what I'm saying in this video. And it would be a lot easier for me to tell you that uh, games journalists are corrupt and paid off because that's what you want to hear. That would get me a lot of positive comments and it would get me a lot of subscribers and it would be shared, it would get a lot of views. That is the thing that would put me in good favor with the internet and I am aware of that. But that is not the truth. There is nuance to that and I'm gonna get into it here. I'm gonna talk about my genuine experiences. Touched on this in other videos and a bunch of facets of, of this in other videos, but this is just one video about this one thing. So I'm just gonna ask you, the internet, and I know it's not gonna work, but I'm gonna try. To keep in mind that it is difficult for people like me to talk about this topic honestly because you may not wanna hear it. But honesty should, I feel like, be the thing that we want the most. I feel like we can all agree on that. I don't feel like either side of this, the media side or the public side, always do a good job of executing on that. So I'm just going to ask you, try to watch this video with an open mind. That's it. I am trying to give you an inside perspective. I'm not trying to reinforce things that aren't true because frankly it would benefit me way more if I lied. So. First thing that I want to talk about is not directly related to that, and to a lot of you might seem obvious, but is a thing that I notice that the internet gets confused about all the time that has come up this week specifically. The Last of Us Part 2 is getting a lot of 10 out of 10 review scores. I do not personally agree with these scores. Frankly, I would not have given The Last of Us Part 2 a 10 out of 10. However, that doesn't make me any more correct than the people who do believe it is a 10 out of 10, and I genuinely do believe that they Think that. The one note that keeps being brought up to me is people saying, well, it has flaws, how can it be a 10 out of 10? Which is where I pull up the uh, IGN is most people's go-to. God, this chair's taking up so much screen. <laughs> so if IGN is most people's go-to for scores, they do get the most um, traffic on their reviews historically. And obviously I can talk about IGN as I worked there as a full-time employee. Let's talk about the IGN review scale. A 10 out of 10 is not perfect. That's, that's, that's really it. A lot of you again probably already know this point, but I want to jump to it off the bat. 10 out of 10 does not mean a game is perfect. Nothing is perfect. On IGN scale, a 10 is listed as a masterpiece, and I generally agree with that. A 10 should be very difficult to get, and I do believe there are um, pieces of IGN's past where they gave out 10s way too readily, but I digress. 10 out of 10 is not a perfect game. On a directly related point, five is not average. And I think that audiences like who put so much weight in review scores, which by the way is why these major websites still have review scores, people complain about the scores all the time. Comment sections, people are always talking about them, they're getting shares. The more audience puts weight on scores, the more it reinforces to these websites that they need to have scores because their audiences clearly really care about them and they get traffic from them. So five is mediocre. That does not mean average. The reason that you get so many game review scores that are around the seven range is because frankly, most of the games that these major sites are reviewing or major magazines or whatever are reviewing are really fucking good. 
If you only play AAA games, which let's be honest, most gamers do, then you only see the games that are getting eights, nines, and tens because they are usually extremely high quality. I mean, Fallout 76 and Crackdown 3 apparently both got a five. So that's worth noting. Those are AAA. But it doesn't mean that there are no games that fall below five. Games come out every single day that would be considered bad or unplayable or broken. But IGN isn't going to waste most of its time reviewing all of those games because A, it's impossible. But B, audiences don't generally even care about those games. That's the shovelware that shows up on the Nintendo Switch eShop. That's half of the junk that shows up on Steam. So yes, loads and loads and loads of bad games exist. You just don't see them reviewed because nobody's even going to pay attention to those reviews. <laughs> For the most part. 10 is not perfect, 5 is not average, 5 is mediocre. A 7 or an 8 probably is the average aggregate score because majority of the games that are being reviewed simply are good. And I feel like that covers a whole lot of the conversation and the, the discourse that I've seen surrounding The Last of Us Part 2 where people have said, well this review even lists flaws, how is it a 10 out of 10? It is still considered a masterpiece by that reviewer. That is, that's the case. Another thing that I want to talk about is Metacritic, because this is a thing that people also don't know. Metacritic doesn't actually accurately just aggregate scores. There are a couple of games at play where Metacritic is concerned. For one, there are a number of negative reviews of The Last of Us Part Two that are unscored. If we click here, Polygon's review is unscored and says, Part two ends up feeling needlessly bleak at a time when a nihilistic worldview has perhaps never been less attractive. The Vice is also negative. The Last of Us Part Two feels complacent, yet also preoccupied with its predecessor. Every facet of the original game has been expanded on and enlarged in the sequel, but not actually improved. Kotaku, same thing. None of those accomplishments elevated or redeemed it for me, like the nature consuming Seattle or the outbreak consuming, of hum uh, consuming humanity, its ugliness overshadowed everything else. These don't have scores. I would say they're probably more likely to be mixed than they are to be inherently negative, but what Metacritic will often do is try to score the uh, unscored reviews itself. <laughs> they will kind of guess and then add a score and maybe they'll do that eventually for these ones that are currently unscored, but they do do that. They also um, weight different outlets review scores differently. So like IGN, because it is The Guardian would be one as well, Game Informer, because they are considered reputable outlets, they get a higher weight than other websites that uh, Metacritic might not be familiar with do. So that is also a thing that is worth noticing. You're putting way too much stock into Metacritic is basically my point. It is also a very subjective outlet in a lot of ways. Obviously the public continues to have this idea that reviews are paid off or that reviewers are giving uh, The Last of Us Part Two a 10 out of 10 because they don't want to be blacklisted from getting more review copies from Sony. The only time that I have ever heard of Sony being annoyed at an outlet where review copies was concerned was when they broke embargo. An outlet agreed to not talk about a certain thing or do something, and the outlet did it. You are not giving The Last of Us a 10 out of 10 so Sony will give you more review copies. They wouldn't do it. And the truth is, if that's a thing that you're worried about, I think that you should be getting angry at Sony and Sony PR and the embargoes that they did put on The Last of Us Part Two that prevent people from talking about a lot of the second half of the game. But I also 100% believe that this is this dude's opinion. This is how Jonathan feels about this game. Knowing this guy personally, I am positive that he at no point thought I better give this game a 10 so IGN can get more reviews. Because writers are a bunch of pretentious idiots, myself included, who care so much more about their own integrity and how their peers view their integrity than they care about publishers. Quickly jumping back in here on this note, because I feel like I phrased what I said poorly initially. This is my biggest criticism of games journalism, is that I do think in a lot of cases, writers write things for their peers rather than for the audience. While that still means they're being honest, it does mean that we have all of these uh, reviewers who, in the case of The Last of Us, are buying into high art because they're very passionate about the games industry and very passionate about storytelling and video games. That is their perspective. But it is also not necessarily the perspective that you know that most people who are going to read your review are going to share. That is a complicated topic as well. But yes, my number one criticism of games media is that I think that a lot of journalists write things for their 
Twitter followers who also work in the industry more so than they do for the people who read the website. Back to the original video. But also, very important note, when I published the negative piece about Mass Effect Andromeda, you know what I was scared of? Genuinely, the public. I didn't even think about EA. At no point did I think, oh no, EA is going to be mad at me if I tear this game apart. I don't care. I can also bet you that every outlet that gave this a 10 out of 10 in no part was like, Sony's gonna love us. They were probably more like, oh my God, the internet is going to fucking hate me, but I have to stick to my guns. Herein lies the problem and the thing that I would ask of you, the internet. If you have opinions on review scores and that someone gives something a score that doesn't align with what you think, but at the same time, you're a person who wants writers to be honest, you kind of have to stop harassing those writers every time they write something that you personally don't agree with. Again, I know you don't want to hear this. I know that you would like this video more if I told you that IGN's reviews were paid off, which dear God, would every journalist at that website ever have leaked it. Dan Stapleton is not the kind of man who's ever gonna fucking take, I never had anyone while I was there tell me to change a review score. They just asked what I thought. They, I was never swayed, not even one time. So if you complain about ethics in games journalism, or you want your writers to be honest, you can't at the same time harass them when they give a score that you don't like hearing, you know? That conflicts with itself in a way that seems very obvious to me, because again, I promise you, writers are so much more scared of the public than they are of publishers. And I guess it's just so weird from the writer's perspective or from my perspective, even as someone who doesn't really give review scores anymore, I try to stay away from all that shit because I can now. I hope to never do it again. To have people complain about ethics and honesty in review scores, but have them also yell when the review scores aren't the ones that they want to read. There are absolutely things that happen at each of these major websites that I think are worth looking at critically. I think IGN first is a bit shady. That is a thing where IGN gets very early access to games as like a cover story game informer style to do a bunch of previews. Previews are largely positive because you only really see the part of the game that the dev knows is going to be sh seen positively. But that exchange of access does mean it would be very complicated for the ongoing relationship of that month of IGN first or whatever it is, if you did say anything negative. I always feel like I was honest in every IGN first that I did, it was maybe two or three. But it is hard to say that there wouldn't be some unconscious bias there that could potentially exist. Interpersonal relationships totally can be a concern. I'm not reviewing The Last of Us Part 2 because I'm friends with Troy Baker. I don't want to do it. It'd be weird. While I absolutely don't think that my relationship with Troy would in any way influence the way that I would review a game, I don't even want the public to have the ability to have that perception. I don't want to take a chance on that subconscious bias, you know? So I'm just not doing it. Relationships between writers and publishers and developers uh, can be issues. Reviewers getting paid off, not an issue. Reviewers giving games a 10 out of 10 because they care about a publisher, not an issue. You'd maybe be worried if they gave The Last of Us Part Two a six. And if it is an issue, I think the public should be getting mad at the publishers for restricting access to journalists who are trying to give you the best idea of what a product is in their opinion so that you can make an informed purchasing decision. They are on your side. On to my third point, which I will talk about uh, on my podcast that goes up on Fridays, Play, Watch, Listen, which is with Mike Biffle, who is a game director, Austin Wintry, who is a game composer, and Troy Baker, obviously video game actor. All of those people have worked in the industry for a long time. I'm gonna have them talk more about this, but I can touch on it. Game reviews do not contribute to sales uh, in the way that the public seems to think they do. Frankly, the like upset that spurts around game reviews is a little bit weird because of how truly unimportant they are in the grand scheme of things. They don't fucking matter. <laughs> yes, there are people who will tell you that they made a purchase based on a review. Those people exist, but the statistics show that in large part, Game reviews do not influence sales. Frankly, press coverage in general doesn't influence sales. Myself and Tom Marks, I believe, worked together to write one of the first pieces about how bad um, Star Wars Battlefront 2 was initially in terms of microtransactions in the multiplayer. The internet seemed furious. They seemed so mad when that all came out. It took EA a few days and then they took them out, but they came back. And from the internet rhetoric around that, you would think that that game wasn't going to sell well. Sell great, didn't fucking matter didn't matter at all. Statistics have also shown, if you look up the news stories, you'll find them, that the leaks haven't influenced pre-orders for The Last of Us in any significant way. You'd think that they had, because when you're like very involved in games culture, it feels like the most important thing in the world. 
they haven't. It pre-ordered better than Spider-Man, which is one of the best-selling games on the platform of all time. And those pre-orders all happen before the reviews even go up. Reviews are just absolutely not as important to sales as I think the public thinks they are. And like I said, I will have people who actually work in the industry and actually have uh, had a lot of stake in games being sold talk about that later this week because I, I, while I have read up a lot about it and can tell you anecdotal experiences, I've not sold a video game. So I don't feel like I should make a big point of talking about that. So yeah, try not to get too mad at me. Of course, I am on the inside. I only have an inside perspective. Back before I worked in the games industry, I was convinced game reviews were paid off too. And then I worked in the industry and I realized how dumb that was. And it is really, really just that people have different opinions. <laughs> if you know that someone can like chocolate cake and another person can hate chocolate cake, it should make sense to you that someone can love The Last of Us Part Two and someone can hate The Last of Us Part Two. They're just a mass of different opinions, I promise. So, in conclusion, one, 10 out of 10 review score does not mean perfect and a five does not mean average. Two, writers are a lot more afraid of you than they are of publishers and I would say most of them don't even think of publishers. If they do, they shouldn't be fucking working in the industry. Three, review scores do not matter anywhere near as much as you think they do. I hope that I have explained my perspective here thoroughly. Please don't be too mad at me. I'm not trying to condescend or do anything like that. I This is, is just a really loaded topic to talk about that people have very strong opinions on and I am just trying to share a perspective that again, I know this video would be more successful and I would get more subscribers and it would be shared on Reddit and it would be broken out into news stories and I would get a ton of views and make money if I told you that review scores are paid off, but it is simply not the truth. It is an easier thing for me to say, but it is simply not the truth. I do recognize that there are some ethical things that can influence review scores because humans are humans. There is no perfect way to do it, but I don't think giving The Last of Us Part 2 a 10 out of 10 means you're a Sony shill. I wouldn't have given it a 10 and I still know that this is just actually what Jonathan thinks. Okay, I'm very nervous to publish this one, but we're gonna do it because it feels like the right thing to do. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I am also gonna have a spoiler cast of The Last of Us Part 2 up later this week where I'm going to have myself being in the 7-8 range, two journalists who gave it a 5 out of 6 in their heads, and another two who gave it a 10 and a 10. So I'm gonna have this like journalist battle royale where you can fully hear these people talk about their different impassioned perspectives live so that you like fully understand it. I feel like it's gonna be really fun if I can actually pull it together without those people killing each other. <laughs> Alrighty everyone, I'm Alana. I will see you guys next time. Bye.